staff and is building things that actually work. Hi everybody, my name is Brad Ross and I'm here representing the great city of Somerville, Mayor Joe Curtipone. I serve as the city's director of transportation. Uh, I'll serve as the MC tonight, but first let me introduce more one city councilor, Matt McLaughlin, who's been working with the mayor's office as well as his colleagues uh, from around the city. And we'll introduce all of that in a quick moment, but Matt's just going to give us a, a couple of words of introduction. Thanks, Matt. Hey, thank you everyone for coming. I'm uh, Matt McLaughlin, Ward 1 City Councilor. Um, I just want to start off by giving the notice that this is not going to be pleasant. I'm not going to try to hide that. Uh, we know there's a lot of problems in Ball Square with the construction coming. But I do think working with the city, working with Mass DOT, there's some potential to mitigate a lot of the problems that already exist, especially with coming through traffic through the ward. I'm hoping that this can possibly lead to something better. And there's also a lot of traffic mitigation that's going to come up as a part of this as well. Uh, so please, everyone, you know, speak your mind. We, can, we still have a month before we really implement the plan. Uh, and if anybody wants updates, you know, I'll show you all our update to be here. I have an email list that I put out announcements all the time. You can come talk to me. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. And we're fortunate to have several of our city councilors here in, rep uh, in representation. So let me go around the room. Or two councilor, JT Scott is here. Thanks, councilor. Ward 3 Councilor Ben Ewan Campen is here. Thanks, Ben. Ward uh, Councilor at Large Mary Jo Rossetti is here. Thanks, Mary Jo. Am I missing any? Oh, Councilor at Large Bill White. Bill, thanks for coming. Appreciate you folks uh, taking the time to be here. So we do have another projector on route. Uh, so forgive us as we get started. Does everybody have some handouts so we at least can start the conversation and start talking about why this project needs to close this bridge? what the city and the Commonwealth are doing with our elected officials, with our residents, our business community, to try to ease the pain. Is there anybody who doesn't have a handout who didn't grab one on the way in? Karen, you want to pass this back to Tom? Great. Thanks. So, Councilor McLaughlin put it well. Um, this is going to be hard. The city is in the midst of a once-in-a-generation renewal of its infrastructure. Everything from the sewer pipes that we depend on to flush our toilets and to drain our low-lying, flood-prone areas to obviously the public transit that we've all been working hard for for you know, longer than the 11 years I've been part of this community. Um, these things are all being built at once. Most American cities can't get it together in this fashion. Most American cities can't deal with these legacy issues. Somerville is not most American cities. We're doing more than most. The consequence is major disruptions to our lives. Fortunately, we've got a great team of public safety professionals working with us every day. So let me now, uh, introduce a couple of my colleagues from City Hall. Uh, Erica Mace, our construction liaison from the city's communication department is here. Uh, many of you probably know her from all of our regular updates. Jesse Moose, our construction compliance manager from the city's engineering department, uh, who is everywhere working on a dozen different projects simultaneously. Thanks, Jesse, for being here. Um, and from our police department, Lieutenant Tim Mitsakis is here, um, Sergeant Scott Whalen is here, and Officer Walter Collette is here. Folks, our first responders have been doing overtime work, working with our engineering team, our communication staff, to get ready for these issues. Back in the dark days of 2015 and 2016, it wasn't clear that we were going to save the Green Line. It was really serious that it was on the table for the chopping block. And among the various things that we had to wrap our arms around as a community um, were efficiencies in the construction process that would allow the MBTA's contracting team to actually move quickly, safely, and efficiently. These bridge closures, whether it's in our neighborhood here on, on Washington Street um, or over on the west side in Ball Square, are examples of that. People always ask, why can't the Commonwealth do what they did with I-93 with the Fast 14 project? Does anybody remember that a few years ago up in Medford and Stoneham and, and all that sort of stuff? Those were deck replacements, the horizontal elements of the highway bridges. Here we have a fundamentally different condition. I'd love to illustrate it for you with a slide, but bear with me. We'll get there. Um, they've got to rebuild the abutments. They've got to widen and renew these bridges. As you all know, how many of you live in, in East Somerville or in Prospect Hill? Most of the crowd. There are freight trains. There's a nightly Boston sand and gravel train that goes over the Washington Street Rail Bridge. We got the Lowell commuter line, obviously. And the Green Line light rail is going to go over those bridges, not to mention the community path. Let's not forget the community path. We all fought hard for it. That's a lot of stuff to fit on the bridge. The bridge is old, it is falling down. And underneath it, there are sewer and drain pipes that drain like 50% of Somerville's land area. 
The MBTA is renewing those drain pipes. It's a kind of an unsung benefit of the investment that the Commonwealth is making in our city. And so for all of these reasons, the construction is going to be long and it's going to be painful. The T is going to close the bridge in April, the middle of the month, April 15th. I hope everybody is well aware of that. We've been using every mechanism possible for the last six to 12 months to get the word out about this stuff, to identify issues, to make sure that we're stress testing the different scenarios. Everything from MBTA bus routes, to bicycle and pedestrian access, to delivery trucks for local businesses, access for uh, workers in local businesses. You know, you think about the unique characteristics of the inner belt neighborhood, uh, that old uh, you know, warehouse and business district. Um, we have a lot of businesses down there that need their employees, need their supply chains to be met. So the Washington Street Rail Bridge represents a series of unique conditions for our residents as well as for our business community. The least important stakeholder group, and I don't mean to make light of this, is regional cut through traffic. So we will spend a fair bit of time tonight talking about you know, this kind of on and off ramp condition. Uh, Somerville serves as an on and off ramp for the regional economy. We know it, we've been fighting against it for a long time. First and foremost, we want to serve our residents, we want to keep them safe, we want to make sure that families throughout the city can get here to the east, can get to the early childhood education programs at the Capuano School. Um, but honestly, if commuters from distant suburbs have a harder time cutting to Kendall Square because these bridges are closed, I say that may be a silver lining here, and I don't need to make light of it. Um, we are planning to make sure that those folks don't trickle their way through into neighborhoods uh, in inappropriate fashions. So, Timeline is April 15th to roughly November 15th. Again, it's easier with the slides, I apologize. Hopefully about 10 minutes from now, we'll have something on, uh, on the screen for folks. Um, so they're going to do this bridge in two stages. They're gonna start taking it apart about a month from now. Um, they're gonna have a full closure and they're gonna work on it all year or all calendar year. About middle of November, they'll put it back together as best they can. They'll open it up for traffic going into next winter. And then in the spring of 2020, about a year from now, it'll close again for another five or six month period. That's different than the Ball Square Bridge method. Um, the contractor and the T uh, have talked about Ball Square being a little different and unique. And so it's gonna be 12 straight months of closure over on the west side. And again, that's kind of uh, you know, factored into our emergency response planning, et cetera. Um, I mentioned our police department, our fire department has been exercising, has been driving uh, uh, apparatus around, has been staging, making sure that their run times, their response times can be met. Um, so that's kind of key dates for folks right now, so to get used to the idea of April 15th to roughly November 15th, 2019, uh, to have these alternate routes in place. Okay. Um, so quick housekeeping check. We're fortunate that this is not just the city doing this on its own, right? I'm representing the mayor here, but we've got uh, folks, Marty Nee, Marty, where are you? Representing the Green Line team. Uh, Marty's out dealing with the projector. Jeff Wagner is here from GLX Constructors, and Hannah Brockhouse is here from GLX Constructors. They've been coming to all our community meetings. They've been flyering in the neighborhoods. They've been door knocking. They've been doing property surveys for abutters. We have hundreds and hundreds of homeowners and commercial business owners who are impacted by the fact that the Green Line has to build walls, has to build drainage structures, um, has to clear out lots and lots of earthworks on steep hill slopes. You know, again, imagine that you're standing on the Walnut Street Bridge or the McGrath Highway Bridge. Um, those 45 degree hill slopes have to be turned into 90 degree retaining walls in order for the Commonwealth to create the horizontal space to actually install the light rail systems. Um, they've got to build overhead catenary wires. Anybody who rides the, uh, uh, the Green Line over on the west side by Longwood or Brighton Alston knows that it's an electric powered subway system, unlike the diesel commuter rail that runs the neighborhood today. So all of that is part of the reason that it takes so darn long to build this thing. Uh, so Jeff, Hannah, we appreciate the fact that you guys have been out in our community taking pride in this project, not as, as outsiders, but as, as true partners for, for the city of Somerville, so thank you. Um, and here's Marty, who's one of John Dalton's right-hand people on stakeholder engagement. And Marty, thanks for all your work. Has anybody had to call the hotline uh, that the T has set up, that the MBTA has set up? There is a construction hotline. You can get connected to a human being 24-7. It's important to note that. There are going to be issues that arise that even we haven't planned for yet. Um, and as a result, there's a seamless process between 311, which is a local program, and the MBTA's hotline. 
Um, so whether it's noise, vibration, light, whether it's concern about emergency responders getting through with a traffic jam, that's concerned about rodents, uh, whatever the issue is, um, we have a system and we meet every week to review the intakes uh, and to make sure that the system is working uh, as designed. So, talk a little bit about why the bridge needs to close, uh, so I won't dwell on that too much. Um, one thing that we've been working to make sure folks understand is that on the detours, and again, I don't mean to make light of this, Washington Street carries something like 15 or 16,000 motor vehicles per day. Broadway in East Somerville carries something like 14,000. McGrath Highway between the two is like 35,000. Those are a lot of motor vehicles. Not nearly as much as I-93, which is about 200,000, believe it or not. Um, but those are important arterials. And so we want to co communicate very clearly, and we've been working with Matt and, and with the other counselors to get the word out about this. There are two primary types of motor vehicle detours that are being advertised to the general public through all media, through physical signage, electronic communications. One is for truly regional trips. And that is going to force motorists coming primarily off I-93, who today are coming down uh, the exit to Sullivan Square, hanging left on Cambridge, where it transitions to Washington Street in your neighborhood, and often trying to get to Union Square, Harvard Square, Porter Square, or Route 2 and Points West. Those motorists, particularly truckers, are going to be diverted eastbound in Sullivan Square and then around the Horn to Broadway to Lombardi and westbound along Broadway to McGrath. So for anybody who lives along those kind of cut through routes of Myrtle Street, Pearl Street, Mount Vernon, we know that you deal with a disproportionate amount of cut through traffic as it is. We know that every morning Russell trucks leave the inner belt and UPS trucks leave uh, Third Avenue and come through your neighborhoods. We know that Waze apps are, are pushing cars through your neighborhoods. Um, for folks who are coming up I-93 from Boston and Dorchester, the detour signage, which will be enforced by on the ground police uh, personnel, is going to push those regional motorists around the Sullivan Square Rotary and over uh, through East Somerville over to Winter Hill. Um, for local folks, primarily you know, Somerville residents, Somerville workers, shoppers, um, there's going to be what we call a local detour route. Thank you, Marty, that seems promising. And, you know, again, there are just a series of choices between bad and worse here. So I don't want to say that this is great. It's Tough Street. It's Cross Street. It's Pearl Street over to McGrath. So, again, if you are a parent uh, who drive, who, you know, leaves Spring Hill or Prospect Hill and brings one kiddo to the Capuano before doubling back over to the Healy or the Kennedy uh, or, or, or the Winter Hill, um, you'll have the ability to go westbound on Washington Street, hang a right on Tough Street, and get onto Cross Street. Um, so that'll be the local detour route. Uniformed police officers will be stationed throughout those detour routes. Um, and again, if a big rig somehow managed to squeak its way uh, down Washington Street, they will be diverted and turned around. They won't be allowed to use that local street uh, of Tufts and Cross. That's really important to note. However, Bus ridership is going to be severely impacted. There are three key MBTA bus routes that are going to be uh, diverted. And each one of those, Route 86, Route 91, and Route CT2, will all be using that local detour route. And it's really interesting. You know, we've been going through this process with the T over on the west side. Um, that bridge closure occurs next week. And it's, you know, kind of keeping us up at night, but we have been getting ready for this for a year. Um, there are only two bus routes on the west side that get diverted in Ball Square. Um, however, they have much longer detour routes uh, than the east side routes do. And so we don't love the idea of the buses going down those narrow little streets. Uh, Cross Street, uh, as it is, is quite narrow. And when you talk to the drivers of uh, you know, Route 90, uh, when you talk to the drivers of outbound Route 80, they always say, you know, this is kind of unique among the entire MBTA bus system. Uh, it's just a tight little street, so to put three extra lines there is hard. Uh, we don't want to sugarcoat this. And yet the T has told us, this is now the bus operations group, that for their customers, minimizing the number of dropped stops is really important to their ridership. Um, keeping their buses on route for as long as possible and minimizing the detour route is really important for their bus operations. So the buses will follow that local detour route. Uh, and again, if you're leaving Sullivan Square on Route 91, you'll go down Washington Street, you'll pass the Holiday Inn, you'll pass Cobble Hill, you'll pass Olivera Steakhouse and Buddy's Diner. 
behind a right on, on Tuff Street. Um, you'll make your way up to the intersection out here, uh, which we know is really a kind of a safety challenge in terms of the number of pedestrians uh, uh, using accessing the school. And you'll hang a left onto Pearl to get over McGrath. Um, and then the kind of the reverse uh, of the Sullivan Square bound routes. So, sure, we'll have a map for you to look at here. Thank you, Marty. So long before these detours, you know, the city has been working on a series of traffic calming strategies. We know, again, that there are too many motor vehicles menacing our residents, cluttering up our neighborhoods, polluting our air. And among our slides that I hope to show you, we've had some success with low-cost temporary materials. Things are easy to deploy. Signage, paint, little three-foot plastic bollards. Um, if anybody ever travels on Mount Vernon Street, uh, you'll actually kind of be able to see in your mind's eye the new buffered bike lanes that we've put in place over on Mount Vernon. We've actually collected data before and after, and we've shown that with you know a few thousand dollars worth of pavement markings, not only have we created a new, safer, normal way for folks to get around the neighborhood on bicycles, but it actually serves to calm the traffic and slow the speeding vehicles down. There's just a little optical illusion that occurs. If anybody lives on Myrtle Street, you'll notice that we just painted out a little fire lane, just a little zebra-striped bump out at the elbow and the curve of Myrtle just last year. Uh, Councilor McLaughlin and, and his constituents have been you know, asking us for years to, to intervene up on Myrtle, so we know it's a cut-through route. Um, those things are working in modest ways, and we're proposing to deploy those types of resources along Tuff Street, along Cross Street, along Pearl Street, along Myrtle, uh, a couple of other locations, Franklin, um, the drop off on, on the east side of the Capuano School is an item of concern with us as we work with the school community. So um, we'll talk in more detail uh, in a couple of minutes about neighborhood traffic calming. For pedestrians who are impacted and don't have the ability to walk under those drippy, dank sidewalks underneath the rail bridge, um, you still get forced out of your way. And for an able-bodied person, it is an inconvenience for somebody pushing a baby stroller, somebody moving with a cane or the wheelchair. Um, it is a massive, massive burden. The mayor has recognized this. Our city council has recognized this. And together, we have funded a city-sponsored shuttle service, a little circulator shuttle service that's going to start its operations uh, in the next month or so. Um, so we're just finalizing the contract with that vendor right now. And that shuttle will be free for all users. You don't have to be a Somerville resident. You don't have to be a Somerville worker. You don't have to be an MBTA bus rider. You don't have to flash a Charlie card or an ID. It's just going to be a little circulator van, kind of like Tufts runs, kind of like Partners Healthcare runs, kind of like uh, the folks down in Longwood Medical or Kendall Square run, just a little circulator bus every 20 minutes that's going to get you from one side of the bridge closure to the other. And we think that that's an important uh, way to respect the fact that, again, people's commutes, people's lives are going to be impacted by these inconveniences. Um, so we want to make sure that the word is getting out about that. <laughs> it's 2019. One of these years we're going to have the right equipment. There's actually a great house unit here. And we arrived here nice and early trying to plug into the house unit. That one failed. So this has been a plan B. So again, thanks for bearing with us. Oh man, I've got this hilarious sign. Okay, so DOT is taking these issues seriously. I want to give credit to Secretary, Secretary Pollock and her team. Has anybody read the press coverage of the I-90 Alston Mass Pike uh, diversions and closures? So Mass DOT learned a lot, right, Terry? Terry McCarthy has joined us. Terry, who's a, again, John Dalton's right-hand person managing the program. Um, and one of the things that uh, DOT learned was they have invested in all of these overhead electronic signs on the freeway system. And Terry and his team, uh, working in partnership with the city, got permission to use the overhead signage all the way up to the New Hampshire border to advertise the fact that the Washington Street Rail Bridge will be closed. The fact that if you're coming from the highway, you're leaving South Boston or Dorchester, you're going to see signage on the overheads that references Somerville, that references Washington Street, uh, that tells you to find a different route. And, and frankly, stay the heck away if you have a choice. Uh, because we want to give people not five blocks worth of notice. We have that five block signage as well, but five miles of notice. The trucking industry has been engaged throughout this process, right, Terry? Um, Massport. Truckers unions, the Teamsters, 
They have all been engaged for the last six to 12 months working with DOT and the highway divisions to make sure that if you know somebody has left Florida or Georgia with a shipment of perishables two or three days ago and is now getting to Somerville, and this is what their you know employer or their navigation app is typically telling them, they're finding out through their industry you know uh, protocols that they have to find a different route so they can make those adjustments again you know six hours, twelve hours in advance. Um, so we're really pleased with that, Terry, and, and we know that you guys have been going above and beyond. Terry, why don't you come up here? Thanks. Uh, along with the uh, last talk, we've um, reached out to bus companies, Chamber of Commerce, uh, we've reached out to all the universities to let them know that uh, um, uh, any of the students, faculty, support staff um, who utilize this area as a cut through to get to their uh, university, that that is going to be much more difficult than they need to uh, seek other routes. Um, some of the other groups that uh, we talked with, um, there's a list of uh, Massachusetts' 100 largest employers, and we actually sent out information to all the human resource departments to inform their uh, employees that uh, the community will change around in this area. And uh, one in-house example, we, we sent it over to Teolas, who's our commuter rail operator, and they actually sent it out to each and every one of their employees' uh, email addresses. So that's what we're hoping these other uh, entities do. Um, <clears throat> we started out with a list of about 400 entities, and it's grown to about 1,000 now. Um, folks have been really good that we've talked to because they gave us two or three more groups to talk to. Um, we was at a meeting the other night, and there were people from the uh, Council on Aging and gave me their contact and sent their stuff out today. Um, they may have gotten it through another means, but... Yeah. Well, thanks, Terry. Uh, so again, just kind of a quick housekeeping check. I'm sorry, uh, uh, we usually have slides that make these kinds of presentations easier and we'll create some space for folks to start asking some questions and we'll get more into the dialogue section here. We've got a mobile mic that we'll pass around. I saw Representative Mike Connolly uh, who's joined us, just wanted to rec uh, recognize Mike and all of his work in partnership with the City Council and the rest of our state delegation on these issues. Representative Connolly, thanks for coming, appreciate it. And um, I did forget a moment ago, forgive me, when MassDOT kind of started this phase of the process, they knew how engaged our community is, and they also recognized that despite the fact that we do community meetings, like four meetings per night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, in the city of Somerville, despite the fact that we have a good web presence, that social networks matter, that individual relationships matter, and so what we asked was for residents to volunteer themselves to serve as representatives and liaisons so there's something called a construction working group that DOT administers, and they meet every month. Several of our members are here tonight. Dylan Manley is here, who represents East Somerville. Dylan, thanks for all your volunteerism and, and all your on-the-ground work, working with Matt and others. Uh, Ryan Dunn is here, who serves as, as the chair and uh, represents the Magoon Square neighborhood. Thanks, Ryan. And did I see anybody else? Oh, Jim, thank you. Uh, Jim represents Union Square and has been fighting the good fight on the green line again for, gosh, uh, Longer than the 11 years I've been here working with you, right, Jim? Yep. So again, if folks have questions, and I realize that we're not gonna answer them all tonight, in part because we don't have our AV uh, situation together, Ryan and Jim and Dylan uh, have been making themselves available to people like you. They've been giving out their emails. They've been managing social media pages. They've been setting up block walks. They've been setting up coffee talks. Um, recognizing that night meetings in elementary school auditoriums and cafeterias are only one part of the outreach and engagement strategy. So I just wanted to recognize them for a moment. Okay. So um, we talked a little bit about the different signage strategies. Anybody who's traveled over on the west side around Powderhouse Rotary and Ball Square will have started to see the big wooden signs that have been installed by the MBTA and their contractor. Um, so that's kind of the second part and the second scale of the signage strategy. We got the big electronic overheads, and then we got the more localized ones, both you know analog, wooden, and printed signs, as well as those mobile units that you know, often our police department manages. 
So um, the electronic flashers uh, that, that we can actually tow around to different hot spots in the neighborhood because we know that month by month traffic patterns will change. This was happening, of course, even before the revolution in Waze and Google Maps, before the revolution in Uber and Lyft. Um, so we have the ability to tow these units around and continue to reinforce that signage message that says, folks, you know, you're on the wrong streets here, and if you are here, you better behave like a neighbor and drive 20 miles an hour rather than you know, blazing through our tight little residential neighborhoods. So folks can expect to see lots and lots of signs. Um, they just unveiled the ball square ones uh, a couple of weeks ago. DOT has learned that um, there's kind of a sweet spot for media attention and for user attention in terms of seeing this stuff and not just having it fade into the background. And so, Terry, it was, what, two weeks ago uh, that you unveiled the ball square signage, uh, about a week ago for some of the signs. And so over the next three weeks or so, you'll start to see the same big orange signs in your neighborhoods on both sides of McGrath Highway. There will be finer grain local signage as well, of course. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, our um, first responders will be out in force. Uh, the police department has been working with us to figure out uh, strategies for boots on the ground. MBTA Transit Police is working in partnership with our local police department. And so traffic control, extra traffic enforcement, uh, all of these things are part of the city's strategies that we've been working on. On the media front, uh, we haven't really talked about the print media or the radio media. Uh, so maybe that's kind of the last thing and then we'll start taking some questions. Uh, so Terry, uh, the big push with radio, with television, with Boston Globe and others. Can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Yep. Approximately um, five weeks ago, um, the MBTA sent out a uh, press release to uh, the media outlets. We actually have contact with about 90 media outlets, and they range from um, the uh, Channel 5, Channel 7, uh, WBZ News, um, from that, we got airtime on WBUR. Um, most of the newscasts mentioned something about the, the bridge closing. Today, we're about 10 days out, and uh, Marty and Eva this morning put together our next press release, and it went out to approximately the same 90. Today's press release was um, specifically for the Broadway Bridge. Um, we since we still talk about Broadway, Washington, even, even uh, Medford that will close in July. But uh, this press release that went out today was um, uh, the Broadway Bridge. And we're, we're pushing to get a little more television time. We've gotten talk on uh, uh, WBZ and uh, BUR, but uh, the, the, the small spots on the TV, we're hoping to increase those. We have had inquiries from um, local news groups. Uh, actually, the Tufts Daily, even the students at Tufts have approached us for their local paper. Um, but um, today we got some reach outs from the you know, local Boston Journal and items like that. So. Thanks, Terry. Uh, so then, you know, the last component of the slides that we wanted to make sure people had in mind uh, was that the city has an economic development group, small business specialists, people who work for everything from, you know, local restaurant tours up on East Broadway uh, to the big industrial and warehousing uh, businesses down in the Interbelt Park. Um, and so we do a series of outreach and engagement strategies through the city's Chamber of Commerce, the Somerville Chamber of Commerce, through Somerville Local First through East Somerville Main Streets, great grassroots uh, business and residence support organization. Um, and so through all of these mechanisms, we've been doing the outreach, kind of understanding people's individual needs, making resources available. You know, we, we have um, business support programs, whether it's technical assistance, you know, marketing support, in some cases, low cost loans that are available to entrepreneurs. So if anybody's a small business owner, if anybody has small business owners in their family, friends, uh, social communities, who has not been connected to the city's small business groups, uh, please do see me or Erica afterwards. We've got business cards that we can connect you with the right folks. We do marketing events. Uh, we do promotional stuff, uh, and coupons and, and, and festivals. And all of this stuff is part of the getting through construction playbook that we've used uh, literally over the last 15 years as we've done big jobs. Uh, East Broadway is an example five years ago. Somerville Avenue between Porter Square and Union Square 10 or 12 years ago. So I just wanted to kind of quickly hit that small business lens 
and, and that was kind of the main modules, the presentation that we hoped to, uh, to kind of use to frame discussions. So that's enough of me talking at you and putting you in more sleep uh, than is typical in the absence of, of visuals. Um, we'll start walking this microphone around, and again, we're intending to try to keep a dialogue going. We've been doing community meetings uh, for the last year on these topics. Uh, we'd ask that everybody keep things respectful. We know that this is a stress point. We know that there's a lot of construction around. We know that we're all stuck in traffic too often and frightened uh, for the safety of our children and our neighbors. Um, so uh, we will answer your questions. We will stay here to the last person uh, has, asked, has asked their last question. Um, but uh, we do ask that everybody kind of keep things civil and, and we'll re answer your questions as best we can right now. Okay? Thanks, folks. Bob, I'll bring the microphone over to you. Sure, Terry, thanks. You spend a lot of time in the field, Terry. I bet you've walked that four and a half, four and a half mile rail, rail corridor a few dozen times in the last year. Um, with regard to the MBTA bus detour, specifically for the Crosstown 2 bus, which has very few stops, is there going to be an alternative stop to the Washington Street stop? And if so, where uh, is it proposed to be? Um, Washington Street and McGrath Highway, the one that is listed as no service. I think um, I can uh, answer that. The, the stop that presently is underneath the um, McGrath Highway, is that the stop you're speaking of? That, that stop will only just move kind of across the street from where it is now. You'll be able to see it. Yeah, kind of, yeah. On the Crosstown, the 96? 86 and 91. Um, we're not um, eliminating um, many stops, if almost none. We're more relocating and moving and adjusting. So we're not, not reducing any number of that, but there are, and I'll just call them adjustments, you know, um, on, on either side of the Washington Street Bridge, and since the, the one right underneath has to kind of move over uh, more towards um, <clears throat> Union Square, and there will be adjustments kind of at that, um, just before Tufts, yeah, but it's literally Tough Street, um, so um, that will adjust. No, no. Yes, it's on the Green correct? Line Extension um, website. Um, you guys it's, have headings, very specific yep, headings. We do. Bus detours for the East Somerville closure. Yep. So it's not like you have to go hunting uh, right. in too awful of a fashion on the website. It's actually pretty well laid out. Yeah. Basically, our, our website, which is, I know it's ancient, but uh, www.greenlineextension.org. Uh, we have other links that go to that. If you go to that um, web address, you will see our home page, and there's a yellow band going across the top of the page. And that band, you just click on, and it brings you to the bridge closure and the bus um, diversion layout. So you can see exactly where stops are adjusted um, on the broad bridge side there are some that are actually eliminated and some temporary stops that will go in place so sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you have another question no. okay cool yeah you know again it's hard right um we're transit planners um part of the reason i got into this line of work uh, was i believe that that you know our social economic and environmental health depends on giving people more reliable transit choices the fact that we're building the Green Line is a miracle, and yet the fact that we're going to make bus riders' lives harder to do so really it bums me out. Um, and so we've been working hard to try to minimize these impacts. Um, the Route 80 and Route 89 diversions on the west side are harder than the 86 C2, C2 and 91 diversions on the <coughs> east side. Uh, east side riders will lose time. You know, the buses are definitely going to be stuck in some traffic, um, but it's not quite as, as severe as the west side routes. And again, let me reiterate for anybody who um, you know, wants to quickly you know, leapfrog back and forth, uh, there's going to be a city-sponsored shuttle running that's free for everybody to connect you from one side of the bridge closure to the other as well. So here's what I got here. I'm a, I'm a regular at Buddy's Diner in the morning, and I see there's a bus stop there coming on Washington Street right there at the corner of Tufts. Now they have new signs that have been put up. You cannot make left or right turns at a certain time between 7 and 9. 
Um, that's going to be a tough spot right there at that intersection before you go under the bridge. What, what, how is that going to be alleviated? Are you going to move the stop down further towards Sullivan Lake? Or are you going to have the bus stop there and everybody trying to make a right turn to go up in Tufts to go up and around and back down around? Yeah, did everybody hear the question? So we've got a, a westbound bus stop in front of the diner uh, for all of those bus lines that's going to potentially be in conflict with those turning movements and everybody getting diverted down Tough Street. Is the question? Yeah. Um, Terry, you kind of... Yeah, I, uh, on situations like that, as I, I was saying a little earlier, um, we've looked at the maintenance of traffic plans and, and a stop like that, we will actually uh, probably move back. Uh, we do a lot of... Uh, as Brad, transportation planners, we actually test buses and, and alike and look at their turnaround. So th there'll definitely be adjustments in spots. On the Washington Street Bridge, though, we're not eliminating spots. We're just uh, bus stops. We're just adjusting them. And, you know, in the long term, um, that location will be equipped with a traffic signal, the red, yellow, green. We know that it's kind of scary. Again, whether you're driving, walking, riding a bicycle, driving a truck, uh, driving a bus, um, it's, a, it's a really tricky thing with those sight lines, particularly because the, the roadway dives underneath the rail bridge. So at the end of this project, two and a half years from now, the traditional red, yellow, green traffic signal will be installed. I wish that we could wave the magic wand and have it built today, um, but you know, there's drainage work happening underneath the street right now, so the normal construction sequence is you deal with those deep utilities first. And then you come back in and build your accessible curb ramps, you paint your sidewalk, paint your crosswalks, and you install your traffic signal equipment uh, once you've dealt with all that sort of stuff. So it's going to be an uncomfortable couple of years. Police details will be stationed there um, to, to help with the traffic flows. Um, and we can check uh, the details on whether that bus stop gets moved, you know, again, 50 feet back to kind of create that extra space. As a Knowlton Street resident, thank you for that stoplight. Um, you mentioned letting large companies know, but just as one specific example I was curious about, UPS has a big distribu distribution facility in Interbelt that has a lot of trucks and packages. They're going to have a lot of rerouting. Is They seem like a key one to be aware of the rerouting plans. Yeah, great, great point, Chris. I mentioned that, and, you know, Russell and others as well. Yeah, those, those fleet vehicles are, are one of the real challenges here. But again, Terry and the team have been working with them. <coughs> uh, working with them. Jeff Wagner, Marty and I, uh, Hannah, we've all uh, worked with the Interbelt um, uh, businesses. Um, we're their neighbor because we our offices are in there. But um, businesses like uh, Triumphant, um, uh, which does the medical waste from they have a hundred trucks a day coming in and out of the inner belt. Same with UPS, who we've uh, reached out to, and um, they're adjusting um, the the best way they can. Hmm? Oh, do they? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And like, in like a fleet, right? Like a little yeah. convoy. And that's, that's some of the things we want to know. I mean, uh, as the closures and detours, uh, please get a hold of us, Brad, um, to let us know if we've caused some anomaly that wasn't there before. It sounds like it's already there, but if th there's something we can do to help, we, we certainly will. And to the point about Myrtle Street, again, we know that this condition has existed for longer than this detour. Um, but still, you know, Matt has been calling me every month saying, how can you guys accelerate traffic calming measures in this neighborhood? We did a tiny little modest thing uh, last fall, um, and our planners are, are working on those issues right now. It's going to be primarily low-cost materials again. And we've got a series of slides that we'd hope to show about these little plastic bollards, movable planters, paint and signage. Um, we cannot restrict travel down public streets. Um, they are there for the public. However, decisions that we make about whether to you know, install these little 36-inch flexible bollards can force traffic to really pay close attention, stop looking at their mobile devices, recognize that somebody might be walking a dog and have you know, taken their eyes off the street and be stepping out between two parked cars. Um, so we understand that when we deploy these types of traffic calming measures that can bless you, can, can actually just cause those drivers, whether they're delivery drivers, whether they're regular, uh, motor vehicles to just behave in a slightly more responsible or humane fashion. Tom, please. Uh, 
Brad, uh, another question on Washington Street. Uh, what will be the limit on the truck sizes that will be able to take that uh, right-hand turn onto uh, Tough Street? And I got a few other questions after that. Uh, so Tom's question was uh, the actual truck size. I don't know off the top of my head. Terry, do you know Big Rigs has always been explained to me that 18-wheelers will not be allowed on a tough street, that they will literally be diverted, be forced to make a left-hand turn by Olivera Steakhouse, the old uh, Cobble Hill Plaza, and then double their way back New Washington Street to Inner Belt Road, simply because the turning geometries at Tough Street and Cross Street Cross Street and Pearl Street can't accommodate that standard 18-wheel big rig. But for a moving truck, for a rider truck, uh, for an average resident who's moving... Uh, um, Service vans. Yeah, exactly. My expectation is that they will be allowed to, you know, they, they can use it today and they'll be allowed to use it in the future. If there's high, you know, if there's intermediate scale vehicles, you know, the traffic engineers, you know, have these different designations for vehicle size, uh, you know, how many axles, what weight class. I don't have that information at my fingertips, but you know, again, we can make sure that that's published as part of this, this, this next big push. Um, so uh, they, what, one of the other issues, though, will be when those trucks are diverted, they're going to be diverted on New Washington Street, right? Come back up onto Annabelle Road, so, and then at the light. So, you know, we, we, a couple of things. The condition of Annabelle Road is really bad, okay? So this is probably only going to make it worse. Uh, but I think the uh, um, one of the things I was wondering if you had outreach to the the trucking industry itself because I know they have a pretty good uh, uh, network between all the major truckers that you know to let them know where detours are and things like that. Uh, the other question would be you know on Google Maps and all those have you been able to talk to them so that when people are trying to get to Union Square you know from wherever. Are they being, do they know that there's the, uh, will they know that the detours are there, that type of thing? So let me answer the second question first, and then Terry, if you don't mind, you can talk about your outreach with the trucking industry. So in the era of Waze and Google Maps and Apple Maps, cities and state DOTs across the country are starting to learn how to, shall we say, collaborate with the tech providers, manipulate the tech provider software, um, so we're getting better at this stuff. Uh, we're, we're part of a, a you know, list serve, and we literally get notifications from Tennessee and California and New Jersey in terms of how individual cities are working with Waze and with Google Maps and Apple Maps. Um, we have the ability as a city to give them information about a closure. So for a true closure like Washington Street, yes, the navigation apps will reference that, and they should do it on day one of the closure. Um, in terms of trying to trick them into keeping their users out of the neighborhoods, again, with the Myrtle Street example, um, we have tried that and we have been, uh, you know, uh, told that that's not what those algorithms are for. Um, so despite our efforts to, to, to try to, you know, give people the right information and keep them out of places that they're not supposed to be, for full closures, the answer is yes. And for, you know, simply, you know, avoiding neighborhood cut through traffic, um, the tools are not as good as we want them to be. But Terry, can you speak to Tom's question about the trucking industry? The, the, the um, trucking industry, uh, we compiled a list, you know, the, the Teamsters and the trucking companies uh, regionally, and we, we sent out information uh, to them, uh, the Mass Trucking Associations and the like. Some of the actual individual trucking companies, they were not as interested or wanted to provide information uh, but they were few and far between. Mm -hmm. uh, we went through the list. What's it? 30, 30 or so. Um the other, the other question was, uh, you know, my business is on in, in about Road, and, you know, I'm affiliated with the Chamber, so there's been a lot of questions about, you know, about all this. Uh, but the, the signage, one of the, one of the concerns I have is you have the large, there's a large uh, sign uh, at close to Tough Street now. What I'm thinking is that really should be back, there should be another one at least back in Sullivan uh, or there because you want to divert these trucks before they actually even head down the street. So I haven't seen that yet. I don't know if that's yeah, on. That's in the plan that we talked with Chris Tucker today that uh, uh, we need to put a, uh, a statue of the yep. yep. And coming yeah. off the ramp, too, right. they'll be able to see, you know, road closed that way. 
Now, the, the other thing, hey, Tom, last Tom, one, I'm sorry. Me, sorry, before you move on, though, yeah. let me just say that, you know, we actually prepared some slides for this meeting, yeah. which we can upload to the web for folks to digest at their leisure. Uh, and that included a list of those big static signs, as well as those mobile units. Um, approaching Sullivan Square from Everett, from the casino site, headed southbound on 99, is one of the locations. Uh, headed north from Lechmere on O'Brien Highway is another one of those locations. Um, Beacon in Washington, Washington Street headed eastbound is one of those locations. Um, Harvard Square, Central Square, West Medford, Medford Square, the list goes on and on. One of the things that the city of Somerville told our partners at MassDOT and the MBTA long ago was that signage, again, that's two blocks in advance of a big closure like these was unacceptable, that we simply had to intervene, you know, one mile, two miles, four miles upstream to respect the fact that, you know, people might miss one sign. We wanted to be redundant, the old belt and suspenders approach, and give people the choice, preferably, if they're going to cut through a neighborhood street, do it in Boston, do it in Medford, don't do it in Somerville. We already deal with enough of that. Uh, <laughs> Last question. Um, with our friends in Boston, uh, you know, with construction being uh, on, you know, at Sullivan and Rufford of Ave for the casino, it seems to be winding down. Have you coordinated with that, that they're going to wrap all this up before the uh, Washington Street bridge closure? Because that's been causing a tremendous amount of uh, backup on Washington Street for at least the last six or eight months. So hopefully that, that'll be done. Uh, you know, I'm not sure what that, you know, you know who our friends are there, so I just want to make sure on that one. Sure do. Yeah, Terry, do you have any intel? Yeah. Maybe you can get that microphone on City of Boston and Brother Dad, Sullivan Square coordination you've done lately. It, there is a, a working group uh, that involves uh, MassDOT, both District 4, District 6, um, and uh, the most of the local police departments in the area, traffic planning. Brad and I talked about going, you know, next week and talking about some of our issues. So weekly we're meeting on coordination with MassDOT projects, which include Route 1 and the Chelsea Viaduct work. It includes finishing up the Alfred Street Bridge, which is on the other side. That ties into working with the City of Boston and District 6 on the Rutherford Ave work that has to um, continue. Um, actually, Hannah, am I missing one of the... Big one? Oh, North Washington Street. That, that's a big one. Um, North Washington Street, which is right next to the Boston Garden, is a main um, access into the city of Boston. Probably six to eight months ago, they were talking about closing that. And uh, we were in a little bit of a panic because that's where we wanted to send our traffic. And they are now building temporary bridges in that location. And they're going to be maintaining one lane in and out which doesn't, you know, is going to be problematic, but better than what the other alternative. Um, so we're, we're meeting weekly on a lot of these regional projects and where things are. And the casino opening will be uh, quite the thing. They're looking at an event like that, the size of the uh, uh, Patriots Parade or something to that level. So it'll be an interesting um, Thing, but uh, there's a lot of good folks. So now uh, I'm going to tell a funny story, and I hope folks will appreciate what, what I'm trying to communicate here. I'm not trying to minimize how hard this is going to be. Has anybody been following the city of Seattle's work on a really important regional highway, you know, the 1950s, 1960s relic called the Alaska Way Viaduct, US Route 99, uh, that runs along the Seattle waterfront? and disconnects and uh, divides the, the heart of downtown from Puget Sound. The Alaska Way Viaduct to Seattle is kind of like our McGrath Highway. The city of Somerville is working for decades to try to tear down McGrath Highway um, because it divides East Somerville from Prospect Hill, because it divides East Somerville from Winter Hill. And Seattle's been going through this process too. Now, they made a decision to tear down the elevated freeway, which carries about 65,000 cars a day, which is kind of equivalent to the Wellington Bridge up by Assembly Square and Ten Hills. Um, that's more than you know, three or four times as many cars as Washington Street in East Somerville carries. They made the decision to tear down the viaduct, which is a courageous and cool decision, but they made a decision to spend billions of dollars to build a new tunnel to provide the same number of travel lanes for motor vehicles because they felt that um, during construction, the traffic might go away, but you know, people wanted to drive. The craziest thing happened just over the last couple of months, and if you Google this stuff when you get home, you'll find all sorts of you know, mass media and industry literature about this. When they closed the viaduct back in like January, traffic disappeared. 
transit ridership spiked by like 25%. Bicycle ridership in Seattle spiked by 25%. People had choices uh, in traditional public transit and in walking and in biking. And neighborhood streets were not flooded with overflow traffic. Other arterial roadways were not flooded and brought to a gridlock. It was the most remarkable thing. And then after that kind of two-month period of demolition where they then re reopened the tunnel, it filled up on day one. All 65,000 cars were back. It was like, where did they go for two months? The point of this story is that when you plan for cars, you get cars. When you plan for a city that's rooted in you know, old-school urbanism, you know, 1850s, 1900s, 1950s, walkable transit-oriented cities, that's when you tend to get more sustainable economies. That's when you get better social fabric, better environmental performance. Um, and the city of Seattle just has this, this remarkable you know, experience lately. So it's very hard for us sometimes to say, you know, we hear you. Traffic stinks. I'm a summer resident. I live this stuff every day. I, my normal commute, whether I'm biking, driving, or busing, is across the Broadway Bridge and Ball Square. And so, you know, I'm going to be living this with, with everybody else, too. And yet, we do not want to build new highways through the middle of our neighborhood just because the math exercise and the equations say that Washington Street is carrying 15,000 cars per day or that the North Washington Street Bridge and Rutherford Ave carry X. Um, let's plan for more walkable, green, and sustainable communities and force the regional traffic to go elsewhere. I, I think that we can do this and get back to our roots. Um, so hopefully that's a, you know, a provocative story and, and folks can add that to their kind of uh, reading list when they go home. Ellen, you have a question. Um, I have a suggestion. Um, because the Medford Street Bridge is closing in July and we need a lot of traffic on Pearl Street, I would hope you would consider not putting the exclusive bus lane Broadway until after the Memphis Bridge reopens. Because um, Pearl Street's going to be inundated with traffic. And some of them slip over to Broadway. I know I will use Broadway. Um, and it's not terrible now. I mean, the front of the works, I mean, it, it's not great for buses, but, but I think until we know what, what the traffic volumes are going to be, it may make sense to hold off on that. And, just see how things go. Thanks, Alan. That's a great point. I didn't mention that earlier. Um, if anybody's been following the city of Everett, they've been the regional leader in prioritizing bus mobility by dedicating a lane of travel on one of their local streets, Route 99, in front of the casino site, from Santilli Circle to the Alfred Street Bridge. Paint the thing red, say it's only exclusive for buses. They have something like 10 bus lines that use that stretch of Route 99, something like 12,000 bus riders per day. It is one of the most important bus corridors in Massachusetts. Uh, and they just have made the courageous move to paint the lane red, and the entire industry is now, the entire region is trying to keep up with Everett. It's pretty cool. We always think about Cambridge and Somerville being on the forefront of progressive issues, and, and little old Everett is really carrying the torch on this issue. We've taken a page out of their playbook. We have planned a dedicated bus lane to serve Route 89 customers, as well as Route 101 customers on Broadway and Winter Hill. Uh, it's something that we wanted to do for a long, long time, uh, and we're under contract to do those installations this construction season. Ellen, to your point about uh, being mindful of the, uh, the impacts on Pearl Street, uh, I, I hear you. We don't have a firm date from our vendors yet, um, and so we can, as the contractors start to tell us what their kind of 90-day look ahead is, you know, if there's a way for us to kind of um, tweak that and say, can you do it in September or August as opposed to you know, June, July, um, that's something we can actually uh, absolutely work with them on. And in the meantime, there's relief on the way. Uh, we're also upgrading traffic signal technology on Broadway. So at Temple Street and at School Street and at Main Street, those are like you know, Reagan era traffic signals uh, that are not talking to one another. You have dead green time where you, know, you get through one of them and you get stuck in the other one. And the city's investing 100,000 bucks of our own money to upgrade those signals. And that's going to work for everybody. It's going to be better for uh, bus riders, for drivers, for pedestrians and bicycle riders. And that does not require the painting of the bus lanes. That will follow it. So I, I hear you. Um, but again, it's a kind of an all side, all, all, all tools approach to try to keep our residents moving, uh, our economy moving, um, but always trying to emphasize the, the low carbon, um, low cost bus mobility wherever we can. Uh,
Actually, Terry, I have a couple of questions for you first. Um, the, the new orange sign, so I'm coming in from uh, Medford behind Tufts, and the new orange sign seemed to not say bridge on them. And, it, you know, me being here in Somerville and knowing that it's the bridges that are going to be the issue, it may be handy to put bridge on those orange signs because people coming from, uh, you know, outside whoever are coming outside the area are going to be like, well, what are they talking about? So putting bridge on those, I think, makes a lot of sense. Um, um, second thing is, so my business is oil. So we're delivering, we have oil trucks. And um, as Tom had brought up a little bit and, and Brad, so what happens when we have to stop on all of these, all of these streets? Are we going to get kicked out of these streets? What, where, am I, where, where are my, you know, my axle trucks are all different sizes. So, you know, that's going to be extremely important uh, for us to know where we can and cannot go. And we are going to have to stop to make deliveries, as you would imagine. Um, so that would be another, that question. Um, as far as if, if I wasn't with the chamber, um, you know, our, our business is not huge, but, you know, we're probably a medium-sized business in Somerville, and no one ever reached out to, out to us. So I, I would say... As far as that goes, that doesn't go. <laughs> That's not working. So you're reaching out to all these other people. What about all the mom and pop stores and stuff like that? They may not have the access that we have. Um, again, being with the chamber and stuff like that, but that needs that should be updated. You know, it's a great great point, Dana. You know, and again, your location, you know, is it so different than East Broadway, where you have this historic and established merchants right. association. Um, and, and if we you know, missed uh, little pockets of business like in your neighborhood uh, down off of Medford Street, uh, oh, we apologize and we can you know, work to rectify that situation, make sure you guys are getting, you and your neighbors are getting as live time information as possible. The question about deliveries is an important one. Again, you know, whether it's moving trucks, whether it's UPS and Amazon deliveries, uh, or, or whether it's you know, critical heating deliveries in the middle of winter. Um, when we've worked with the bus operations group, there's a great woman, a summer resident who runs the service planning group, and she mostly come, comes to most of these meetings. Um, and she has talked about how difficult it is to have two buses pass one another uh, on a street like Tuff Street. And they have been working with us to figure out, can we temporarily eliminate some on-street parking to create a safer passing condition for those buses? we can integrate the idea of a delivery vehicle, particularly something like a fuel truck that's going to need an hour, I assume, to kind of do its no, work? It, it's, it's probably, you know, 15 minutes at the most, you know what I mean? So it, it, is, it is faster than you would think, but it's still, you know, people yell at us when we stop for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, whatever. Now, you can just imagine when this happens. Uh, so so that, that's going to be an issue. And just a, a second, another question about... I'm sorry, before you go on, hold that, hold that question. So yeah. our police department, again, has been great. Um, and among all the other things they've been working on is not only stationing officers at some of the twists and turns of these detour routes, but they've actually competed for and won grant funding to pay for the cost of bike patrol officers. So, you know, officers who are more mobile and not kind of stuck in the same traffic that everybody else is stuck in. And so we can expect to see some of the police uh, uh, personnel in the neighborhood troubleshooting. You can expect to see folks from our engineering team walking around with the yellow jackets and with our cell phones to say, oh my goodness, some unforeseen circumstance has arisen and we need to make sure that the police officers, the fire department is aware of a condition that whether it's a routine uh, uh, delivery or if a windstorm blows through and, and a tree's down and suddenly DPW is having to go you know, do emergency work around wires, We've been stress testing those scenarios, and you're going to see a lot of city personnel, again, with transit police, MBTA, and their contracting team working to, to identify and kind of you know, make, call those audibles in the neighborhoods. Uh, so we're working through those processes. Okay, but you had a second question. Um, so uh, Tom had brought up a really good uh, thought when I was talking to him the other day. Um, Myrtle Street, would they ever consider doing it a two-way? Uh, Myrtle or any of the other streets that are one way now just to take some of the pressure off a of tough street where By looking at most of the stuff most of the stuff is gonna go down tough street and Myrtle to a, to a point um, And I know that neighbors aren't gonna be happy and I wouldn't be happy either, but it's it's balance It's like you said, it's balancing you know, uh, it's, it's funny Dana. We've had conversations like this with folks in East Somerville for years and One of the with controversial stuff like this. We always ask you all to inform us about what trade-offs you're comfortable with. Nobody wants 
2,000 cars coming through their neighborhood street per day. That's about the number, maybe it's 2,500 that we've measured on Myrtle. Uh, Mount Vernon uh, it takes up, you know, picks up a little bit more, it's like 4,000 per day. Nobody wants 2,500 or 4,000 cars on their neighborhood street per day. However, the fastest streets that we measure, the streets where the cars are driving fastest, are actually the one-way streets. Most of these streets presumably were two-way back in the day, and they were changed in the 60s or the 70s or the 80s or the 90s, uh, and often they're kind of oversized, they're over-wide for one-way travel. And the way that human beings drive is that when stuff is not flying by in your peripheral vision, there's an optical illusion and you feel like you're on a highway. Next time you're on 983, look at, the, look at those lines. Uh, they're about 12 or 13 feet wide. Tough Street is probably like 26 or 28 feet wide, maybe 30 feet wide. And so when we have these, uh, these tight little neighborhood streets, it actually forces people to drive a little bit slower. Think about you know, snowpocalypse back in 2015 where we had you know, four foot snow banks everywhere that are encroaching onto the street. It forces you to drive slower. So our posture to date on this important question of whether Franklin Street or whether Myrtle Street, Florence Street could play a different role in the neighborhood's mobility network, um, we try to be respectful and say, if residents come to us and say, you know, we understand that this could have some pros and some cons, can you guys evaluate it? from a technical standpoint, we will mobilize those resources and do the technical evaluation. But we're, we don't want to force fit those things and presume because you know there's no free lunch in this world. There would be some benefits and some drawbacks. But again, we hear from merchants on East Broadway. They're like, we've got six or 700 workers down in the Interbelt Park. And they don't come to get lunch or do their dry cleaning up on East Broadway because they are stuck on in traffic on Washington no. Street and have to get on McGrath right. to get up here. Right. That makes that makes total sense. Just just a thought. Total sense. Um, we just have those ideas. We are all ears. You can reach us. And the last question is just Alfred Street. What's going on? That's already a nightmare near near Mount Vernon. Um, is that is there anything going to be uh, going to be there that will help that area? Uh, because, like I said, already it's a nightmare. Thanks. Dana, are you referring to uh, you know, Mafa, where it feeds into Sullivan one way, past the Mount Vernon restaurant? Yeah. yeah, that's brutal. And Tom was asking earlier, I think, about the status of, of the casino's construction in the city of Boston on the Sullivan Square side. So the casino was mandated to do a bunch of stuff uh, for mitigation as part of their permits, um, and they're finishing up that work right now. New traffic signals, uh, some new curves, some new pedestrian and bicycle safety measures, Actually, some dedicated bus lanes are, are all part of their obligations. So they're finishing up that work now. Uh, I hope and trust that that's going to help things flow a little bit more smoothly. Um, I was stuck in those lights recently, and I was wondering about the timing. We've worked with DOT to adjust them. Um, honestly, there's just you know, too many vehicles flying off the freeway and then gumming up the whole system. Um, so we can always adjust the timing. We can work with DOT to do those sorts of things. Um, but I think that there are some larger investments that are needed on the Somerville side of the border. And, and in particular, there's like there's two southbound off ramps for I-93 South. One that hits um, you know, kind of stop and shop uh, and then threads its way to, to Lombardi and Broadway. And one that just kind of flies through and skips Lombardi and Broadway. And every time I look at them, I'm like, really? Our neighborhood has to deal with two off ramps, two feeders to those congested signals. Uh, maybe we should experiment and close one of them and see what happens and see if it's safer and more humane for the neighborhood. Um, those are the kinds of conversations we're able to have with EOT outside of the Green Line contract. Um, yes, you've been waiting on it. Forgive me. And then we'll come over here to you, sir. Please. Um, hi. I, have, I live on, near the high school, and my kids go here to school. Will there be a detail at Cross and Pearl? Because that's going to be, it's it's be bad in, during morning, afternoon, evening, after school. Sure, it's all day or dur during during morning like morning before school 2:30 pickup and five o'clock when after school and rush hour is happening i don't know the details uh in terms of the timing we're still working with the police department on, on those details um sergeant whalen do you want to chime in on this one Okay. Got the same concept down here. All the way to Tufts now without a detour um, after 4 p.m. sometimes. 
Yeah, true story. And you know, I was goofing on the traffic signals on Broadway in Winter Hill a minute ago. Um, that one is also kind of a legacy traffic signal, and we've been working with the MBTA and their contractors to update the timing of that one. Um, and if they need to, you know, do some wiring so that it can be a little bit more responsive, and, and if all of a sudden one of the directions spikes up, then we can tweak it more easily because the wiring has been upgraded. Uh, and they've been again, they've been good sports. They've said, "Yep, we can and will do those things." Cross and McGrath. Cross and Pearl uh, are the primary locations here on the east side. There's a couple over on the west side where the same condition. Uh, where like, folks, you need to update the McQueen Square signal because the traffic pattern is going to be fundamentally different. And, and Green Line contractors have been great with this. Uh, a couple of quick questions on the the uh, the U-turn on McGrath on the bridge will be closed to vehicular traffic if you're coming if you're coming down the ramp. And you can take a U-turn and go back McGrath and Overcross. Is that going to be closed to locals? You can still do that driving. Okay. Everybody know what question was southbound? Yeah, exactly. With the Route 90 bus, the Route 90 bus will still be doing that then. Oh, okay. And then um, uh, for people coming for Somerville residents coming off of 93 and turning up Washington, is there going to be some kind of ID? Or are we all going to be allowed to do it? Because I ask because when the high school, the, the Highland was closed for the crane, I was not allowed to pass, even with my ID, no only buses, and as a resident wasn't notified. And it was just a few days. This is obviously you're doing a much bigger job here, but I'm wondering how residents will be ensured that they're allowed to come up Washington Street. Well, I hadn't heard that about the high school. Okay. also asks us to keep an eye on things to be collecting data. So anytime you see those little traffic tubes running across your street, know that that's official city business where we're actually counting the cars, we're counting how fast they move. Um, sometimes we install video cameras uh, that have the ability to tell us, for example, how many times are motorists stopping, which is Massachusetts law for a pedestrian in a crosswalk. Um, so all these automated data collection uh, techniques are, are things that we're mobilizing so that we understand. And if, you know, anecdotally, everybody's always going to say, yeah, traffic's bad, I've been stuck in traffic, or there are too many cars coming down my street. We want to honor that, and we also want to screen it against, you know, quantitative data collection. Um, so folks can expect to see that. And then that's going to help us adjust to, you know, our, our, our police staffing needs. Um, if the fire department needs to, you know, do exercises and kind of test things out on a different route because of something weird that's happened, then we're going to have data to back that stuff up. Um, I didn't mention it earlier, but uh, it may as well right now. Um, the entire East Somerville neighborhood is a safety zone, is a slow zone. 20 mile per hour speed limits are in place. Um, it's a progressive step that, that we took. I'm trying to, again, honor the fact that you folks have been dealing with the burden of fast moving vehicles for a long, long time. Um, so everywhere in East Somerville, between McGrath, Broadway, and Washington Street, the police department and their traffic unit now have the ability to enforce uh, people driving 25, breaking the law. Um, and so having, again, that, that data helps us uh, with, with doing that, kind of, that side of the work. Um, finally, uh, will, will residents at least coming off Tufts be able to take a left over the cross street bridge to join McGrath and go up to Highland? Okay. 
Yep. And actually, that's probably where our free sh city shuttle is going to run as well. Uh, the little small kind of 12 or 14 passenger ADA compliant shuttle will be able to make that sharp turn and get across the cross street bridge, turn down a little Austin Street, uh, and kind of have like that terminus at, at, at the bus stop at, at Austin the Rath there. So again, it's not even going to be pushed quite as far out of the way as the, the traditional MBTA buses are. Um, I, I want to suggest um, one sort of relief for the northbound traffic, uh, no, for the southbound traffic, and that is that if you could allow for a left turn where McGrath crosses Medford, uh, um, Myst Mystic Ave, then that would, uh, that's al an almost no access street, so you're not m messing up the East Somerville uh, businesses, but it would probably allow for a lot of trucks and, and other uh, people trying to get through to take a left from Mystic onto the McGrath heading south. It's now a no left turn intersection. And uh, that would, I, I believe, it, would, it doesn't help the, uh, uh, the northbound traffic, but it would really help southbound. Uh, yeah, yeah. Up by the stop and shop. Yeah, we refer to that uh, as a spaghetti bowl of old ramps and tunnels. And right, things. right. But and a fair number of people are taking illegal lefts there now. But but if it were in fact legal, it might go ahead and and uh, just get sort of a tube uh, effect of, of drawing a lot of uh, uh, southbound traffic away from uh, uh, Broadway. I appreciate that. Um, we actually are in conversations with MassDOT. They've got a, a, an engineering process underway for that entire spaghetti bowl to improve the safety of it. And it's tied to, you know, five or seven million dollars of construction funding that doesn't come available for another couple of years, unfortunately. So the design process is underway. And if there are ways for us to identify small little temporary paint and signage based uh, changes, uh, we will try to explore that. That's a good point, but I don't want to create unfair expectations about moving curbs uh, or, you know, substituting traffic signal equipment. That stuff takes a year and it won't be. But thank you. Oh, my question is, I live right off of Washington Street on Franklin Avenue. It's a very small street and we're already getting a lot of traffic. My concern is the very end where it turns when you're walking to come down, it's really dangerous. You can't cross this. I mean, they're just flying around that corner. So I'm really concerned about the extra traffic, not only for me to get out of my driveway, which is already difficult, just the, the walking, because I have children that walk that way. Yeah, I'm sorry, are you referring to the corner of Franklin Avenue and Washington Street or Franklin Avenue and Franklin Street? Franklin Avenue and Franklin Street because it turns like yes. this. Yep. So when my kids yep. are walking home, it's already dangerous. And that's the playground, right? Uh, uh, that's the, the community school, that's the playground, that's the soccer field, the basketball because, courts. I mean, everyone, I know you're supposed to go Tufts, but once you get stuck in traffic, you're going to go down Franklin. No, you're totally right. I mean, no. this. <laughs> Matt and others have been pointing out Glen Street will we'll, we'll absorb some of that pressure. Franklin, exactly. of course, will do. So, you know, the staff on our team at City Hall have been working on these traffic calming measures, these little paint solutions. Um, do you know the corner of Gilman Street and Cross Street and Oliver Street? They've got those big red bump outs that kind of mimic like a brick curb extension or a brick crosswalk. That's been a tool that we have used in a bunch of locations around the city, including in East Somerville. And again, we've measured the, the data, the benefits of them. I had a slide to show you. Um, about them slowing the cars down. It's the weirdest optical illusion. It actually gets people to drive slower. And more importantly, in some of these places, to take their turns at more of a 90 degree angle rather than kind of a slingshot gradual angle, you have to turn the steering wheel, you have to pump the brake. Um, that's what we want in these tight little neighborhoods. And Franklin Street is frankly one of the more concerning locations for me in the entire four square miles of Somerville that, I'm, that my team is responsible for. Um, so the team, uh, the staff that, that work in my office are working on paint-based solutions for Franklin Street. Um, Rich Malella, the team at the public schools, have talked to us about the paratransit and the drop-off services for the Capuano and how that backs up traffic and then people do goofy things when they're stuck in that kind of traffic to Dana's point about uh, deliveries uh, of oil vehicles. So that is very much on our mind. I don't have a good answer for you right now, but know that we're thinking about it. Yeah, because where, I mean, I'm on Franklin Avenue. So even like last night I had food delivered and I had to run outside and run to the street because people were already beeping at, there's no way, there's no parking. And Franklin Avenue is a one way northbound off of Washington, right? It forces you to get dumped onto Franklin Street, right? 
it forces you up to Franklin Street, but then they cut over to go up Glen. Ah, which is technically illegal, right? Because they're going against the one way on Franklin. <laughs> We can well, make sure that it, we can make sure that our traffic yeah, is cut, also kind of flagging that. Yeah, you just kind of cross Yeah. Yeah. So you just kind of cut across. They almost lined up, but my understanding they is that is technically up. illegal. Right. Uh, so, uh, our uh, captain uh, uh, of our traffic unit couldn't be here tonight, but I've always heard him talk about how that those sorts of little offset intersections, which are all over Somerville, are technically illegal to make those moves, and, and people can be cited for them. Right, right, uh, tons of examples. Um, so again, we'll be looking at those locations and really thinking about those vulnerable users of, of young people, their parents and caregivers. Oh, Steve, please. Hi, uh, Stephen Mackey with the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, thank you very much for all you're doing. You know the Somerville Chamber has uh, always been very much behind this Green Line extension and uh, also the Orange Line addition that we got a number of years ago. Um, so it ha we understand it has to be done, and we appreciate very much all the work uh, that you and DOT and everybody else have been, and various departments have been doing. Um, but I think way back, uh, one of the meetings on a Saturday morning, Ball Square, when you had the, the table out and everything, and asked the question, is there, we know DO Mass DOT has done hundreds of bridges, has heard everything before, uh, has seen everything before, here uh, at Memphis Street, closing a bridge, a mile and a half, less than a mile and a half this way, closing another bridge, less than a mile and a half the other way, you're closing a third bridge. So in the most densely populated city in the New England, we're closing three bridges uh, for a time at the same time. There are hundreds of examples of bridge closures. Is there any example of th three bridge closures like that, almost consecutive bridges in a densely populated area, number one. I'm not aware of one. Num num Terry, are you? You, you, have a, you have a statewide responsibility. Press the power button, Stephen. I'm sorry. I think it shorted out on you. Thank we, we, you very City much. Cable is recording this for what it's worth without our, without our slides. You guys in transportation are doing a great job. We have a great police department and a great fire department. But I don't think the fire department is getting made any bigger for this. And I don't think the police department is getting made any bigger for this. And some of them is paying a lot of the bills in terms of mitigating the day-to-day, -day, hour by hour, have the people at the top, and I'm talking um, the, the head of emergency management, the head of DOT, the governor, and other people, been told this has not been done before? I mean, the short answer, Stephen, and I don't mean to make light of it, is yes, our mayor, our city council, and our state delegation have been banging these drums for the longest time, uh, and people do respect the fact that Somerville has been asked to do something that no other municipality in Massachusetts has been asked to do, which is directly fund uh, a public transit extension in Massachusetts. Uh, that was a painful reality of saving the project, and so yes, we have raised these concerns. Um, the project team at DOT, um, Terry's team uh, at, at the GLX, um, have been working with us, and I would argue been going above and beyond uh, to try to mitigate and work with us. They're deploying um, first responders on their dime. Transit police is working in partnership with our police department. So we are getting additional boots on the ground, additional public safety professionals. Um, they are updating signal equipment, as I mentioned, modifying certain traffic signals, installing overrides. So for, like the last couple of locations in Summerville that fire department vehicles don't override the traffic signal, they're upgrading on their dime. Those are small measures, and so I hear what you're saying but I also don't want to, 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 to mischaracterize things. I think they have recognized the unique burden that they have asked our city to bear, uh, and yet they have also said, folks, this was the consequence of saving the Green Line. 
This was not a foregone conclusion than anybody, again, who's been following the federal government and their contracts with transit agencies across the country know that this group, shall we say, in Washington has actually been violating contracts and has been you know, telling transit agencies and state DOTs to turn money back and leaving projects in the lurch. Um, and so every month and every quarter on this project, it is still our quest and our cause to save the Green Line because this crowd in Washington could pull the rug out from us. I, and I don't want to, again, be Pollyanna here, um, but, but this, this is the environment that we are dealing with. And we're doing the best that we can with the resources that we have. Our mayor, our council, our delegation are working overtime on these issues to try to identify things, get additional resources where possible. Um, but that doesn't mean I have a good answer for you, Stephen. So I, I hear you, and I'm sorry. I just, I just can't add. We, we do um, coordinate efforts with MassDOT and uh, our projects, and they are quite aware of the um, public safety needs in the area, and um, we're doing our best to support that, and um, we'll continue to do that. Uh, hey, thank you, Brad. I have a Ward 3 question, selfishly, but also before I ask that, I just want to say that the City Council was briefed by the Fire Chief, who made clear, this was a concern for a lot of the City Councilors, that we're partnering with the neighboring communities. I don't know if this was made clear, that they are on call on both the east and the west side of the city uh, automatically. So for folks that are concerned about fire, that is, that is already set up, that is 100%. So I don't want anyone to be nervous about that. So the, the, the small kind of Ward 3 questions that I have, um, at the intersections where people can cut off Washington onto Prospect Hill and Greenville, um, this is a neighborhood that's already being really slammed by the Somerville detour. It's basically gridlock every day. The sewer project in Union Square, Ben? Yeah. Yep. Uh, so are there going to be details? There are abutter-only signs there, but they're not particularly effective. Um, has that, have those details been planned? Thank you. No, thanks. Um, you know, we have been working, again, Erica has been taking phone calls, you know, on weekends and nights. Uh, Jesse uh, Moose uh, has been, you know, out block walking, working with merchants, average residents to try to identify conflicts and fix them in the field. Um, no matter what kind of plan you have in place, there are going to be circumstances like the Columbus Ave, Bonner Ave issue that you and your constituents have been dealing with that are going to manifest themselves here. And I'm glad that you and others, Ben, have brought up the Greenville and Prospect Hill Ave uh, uh, likelihood that southbound McGrath uh, or even Highland Ave traffic, you know, just bends around and tucks into the neighborhood that way. Um, that will be one of those locations that we keep our eyes on, um, that if we can rotate uh, police coverage over there, if we can collect data. And then again to the question earlier about two-way and one-way streets, about reversing ones, um, about placing sawhorses or construction barrels to create these artificial little neck downs that just discourage those casual drivers who are just staring at their navigation app and think, oh, here's a lowest common denominator cut through. Uh, let's just make them think one extra time before they do it. We need to continue to maintain access for local residents to get to their homes. We understand that. Uh, but for anybody who's just trying to avoid, you know, construction detours and wants to worm their way through the neighborhoods, there are a variety of physical signage and paint solutions that I hope we can deploy um, even more quickly. One of the challenges with the Somerville Ave sewer work is that this, you know, timing was intended to happen several months ago when we had, you know, kind of a longer school break. Um, and because of coordination with private utility companies, that wasn't possible. And so we had to take advantage of a one-week uh, school shutdown. And it's not painting season yet. It's barely even construction season. And, and I hope and trust that as spring finally rolls around, knock on wood, it's going to be easier for us to deploy pavement marking crews. So the example of installing a new um, thermoplastic stop line. Uh, there's a little neighborhood street that, that Ben and his constituents have been working with us around. Um, if it was April or May, it would be easier, I think, for us to get some thermoplastic on the street and really reinforce a stop sign that's out there today. Um, but most of those pavement marking vendors close up shop seasonally and it's harder to get them to mobilize. So we do want to apply the lessons learned um, about signage, uh, about on the, on the ground uh, police details, and about these artificial kind of construction barrel oriented neck downs to try to reduce the likelihood that something like that emerges on the other side of Prospect Hill for neighbors who have been already dealing with this stuff. I hope that's a, help, a helpful discussion. If it's, again, it's, it's, it's not a good answer. I'm not pretending that it is. Hi there. 
Uh, currently, applicants for recreation, uh, rec recreational dispensaries are being asked to complete a traffic and parking study as part of their application process. With so much in flux, do you see any issues with the completion and submission of those studies? Oh, wow, that is an inside baseball question for traffic engineering nerds. Um, yes, there, there are going to be um, non-representative conditions for, for any traffic study that's occurring, and yet there are formulas that get used by the traffic engineering industry. Um, MassDOT has a series of permanent counting equipment um, that they use then that all the engineers have access to, and so they make seasonal adjustments. Um, you know, typically what they find is that summertime, traffic drops by 25%. So anybody who does a traffic study in the middle of August, even without big construction projects, is forced to inflate their numbers a bit and we'll figure out the appropriate uh, inflators to get an understanding of existing conditions for any traffic study for utility work, for development projects, or for this you know, specialized business licensing process. Thank you. Please. Questions? Please. Oh, yeah, yeah. Alan, you've been waiting and then we'll work our way back, okay? Yep, thanks. I just had a, a question more for the police. Um, uh, during uh, school, when school lets out on um, East Somerville Community School, people stop and pick up their kids there. And sometimes they double park. And I've been by there where you see kids running across the street and you can't see. And I'm wondering if the police could be over there because it is such a dangerous situation. You can't see, and you know it's going to get worse because there's going to be more traffic. So that's just my point. Ellen, were you specifically referring to the Cross Street side or the Glen Street side? I'm sorry. Both, both, no. Or even Pearl I'm Street. I'm talking about Pearl, Glen, and Cross. It's it, it happens on all three. Um, Pearl is a little narrower, and so it's it's worrisome because you really can't see. But it's but it happens on all three. Okay, um, forgive me. I know some of the the head counts for crossing guards at some of our community schools, but but not this one. We have, I assume, one, there are guards. a couple of them at Pearl and Cross. Right. Yeah, I hear you. Okay, we can make sure not only our police department and our crossing guards, but also our traffic and parking group, as well as you know the engineering and planning staff uh, who are going to be on, on the ground, are, are working to identify these issues. And, and honestly, if we have to go out and put some of those flex posts down um, that really demarcate the lanes and kind of divide, you, you can you can literally trace the double yellow or where the double yellow is supposed to be on, on, on Cross Street. Um, to really kind of say that, you know what, you, you can't double park here. You have to keep moving. Um, those are tools in the box for us as, as we try to incentivize safe behavior. And again, nobody wants, uh, you know, a vulnerable youngster to be you know, darting out uh, with sight lines are no good and somebody who's been frustrated for being stuck in traffic decides to do one of these uh, around them, right? Um, we're, we're very mindful of that. But thanks for, thanks for raising it. I'm, I'm sorry, can you hold on one second? Sergeant Whale wants to jump in on this. Yeah, Scotty. Just to follow up on her question, um, I think the best course of action for something like that would be to file a 311 request, and that will delineate um, coverage for traffic and parking offices. But, but then we're using our phones while we're driving. Not while you're driving. <laughs> when, you're, when, you're home, when you're home at night, you can put the request, you can just type an email in and put a request in that that's an issue. And that will trigger traffic and parking to step up their enforcement there, and that will get us to, you know, dedicate resources down there. <laughs> no, no, yes, so I'm serious. We've got staff here who are taking notes, um, and, and I don't want folks to, to, to discount the importance of 311. It's a live data tracking tool for us. And when, whether you call about a rodent, whether you call about a traffic tra safety issue, it enters a database. And every morning, the mayor and the senior team review those calls, right? Um, and so if traffic and parking needs to place a new piece of signage, if we need to actually have, again, that adult conversation about a parking space, a curbside parking space that's for the benefit of our residents, you know, two-hour or resident permit parking, and we need to convert that to like a 15-minute pickup and drop-off space to make sure that more of those pickup and drop-off uses for the school uh, have a safe place to get curbside, um, those are the kinds of things that, that we can take this conversation and apply uh, for, for implementation. Um, so again, drop those dimes. Call 311. Uh, it's not just the GLX hotline, but those are local issues that, that we can and will respond to. Sorry. 
Getting back to the getting back to the detours, you have everyone going down Pearl Street, changing at Cross Street. What's going to stop all the cars like they do now from cutting through? I live on Mount Vernon Street, okay, and it's a total mess. You gave figures I couldn't even believe, 4,000 cars. Crazy, right? Okay, I never in my life thought it was that high. Five years ago, if you had 2,000, that was a lot, maybe 1,000. And I almost did laugh when a person mentioned about cutting, no offense, but cutting Myrtle Street. We want to go the other way with it. Right, right. Yeah, Mount Vernon has is, is taken more and more of a burden. And again, you're, you're absolutely right. We've got data from 2017 that shows it was, you know, 3,000, for example, and now it's 4,000. So, so it's increased 25% in just a couple of years. Um, and so we want to continue to discourage that in any way we can. Why can't you stop people who do not live there in a cutting through to go up Route 93? And it's a speedway. And it's a speedway there. Because I'm right at the corner. Cars do not stop half the time. To go in the driveway where I live, which is the first or second driveway, what you want to count. And we usually got a few people swearing when I do a crazy thing. I stop to let the people go by in the street. Imagine that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Common nice. courtesy. But what do we, yes. And my wife wants me to stop. And I said, no. We have her so what alternative would you have, which if you could correct that, you make the area better for people, too, that they could not cut through. You know, some of the uh, signage that we've talked about being deployed at the regional scale, Sullivan Square, uh, I-93, uh, Route 16, et cetera, you can figure out local versions of it. And we've been hesitant about that, about, you know, just putting a bunch of signage in the middle of the neighborhoods. But it's also a tool in the box for us. And so if at the corner of Myrtle and Pearl, if at the corner of uh, uh, Pearl and Franklin, if there are additional signs that say, you know, again, hey, if, if your destination is westbound on Broadway, um, then maybe Franklin to the traffic signal is, is a better option than somebody just following their navigation app that thinks that Mount Vernon is faster, for example. The fact that people want to connect up to I-93 is a dilemma and it's a unique burden on Mount Vernon Street, and we haven't been able to solve that. We've been adjusting the traffic signals. We've been tweaking the, um, uh, the bike lane. One of our goals this year is actually to put a bunch of movable planters in there, which will prevent vehicles from drifting into the bike lane and, again, kind of create that little pinch point that's going to discourage a certain amount of drivers and force them at least to go slower, if not stop using the facility altogether, uh, but try to green things up, uh, try to slow things down. Uh, these are some of the best tools that we have available. But, but again, we, our community has been invaded by motor vehicles, and the tools that we have to deal with that are, are, are relatively limited, given the scale of the challenge. So I, I hear you. When, when the people are down at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, like I said, they're going to New Hampshire or going to North Shore, in most cases, and they don't give a shit for no one. No one. So please tell me what we can do if it's more signs at the corner. I'm at the corner of Perkins and Mount Vernon Street. They did Pearl Street, which is helpful a while. The only thing is they just cut through the other streets. You have to put it every street, which I wish we do. Well, we can follow up again. You know, Matt is, uh, has a list of, uh, of items that he you know, relays to me every month for sure, right, Matt? Uh, and we can follow up and make sure that this is part of that list for following through. Folks, again, thanks for bearing with us. I realize this is not the format that you signed up for and the night that you took away from your business or your family to come here and just have essentially a fireside chat. Um, with a couple of project staff from the city and from the MBTA, so we do appreciate your good faith. Quick time check, it is 8.15. We will engage with you. We will have questions if uh, folks are more comfortable with one-on-ones. We've got display boards, but I want to you know, provide a, a clear blessing that we won't be offended uh, if you choose to, to, to eat the dinner at this point. Um, are there any issues that we have not touched on that are important to people? We spent a lot of time talking about traffic congestion, about safety, about business issues. Um, is there anybody who feels like, oh my gosh, there's this elephant in the room that we haven't even talked about? Um, we'll be back. We will be uh, having a conversation uh, about, you know, kind of the 30 days in, uh, 45 days in. Um, how can we make sure that you and your neighbors are plugged in? People who can't come to community meetings, people who aren't well served by these types of formats, do they have the electronic, fa uh, you know, engagement techniques? Do they have the multilingual outreach techniques? We bring the meetings to the neighborhoods, you know setting up tables on Broadway, going to the community-based organizations, the churches, uh, the senior center. We've been doing all those things and will continue to do so in your neighborhood. So we don't want to leave you with the perception that this is the only way to raise your questions or to engage with your local officials. Um, so you can expect to see lots of us in the neighborhood in all these different formats. 
we do want to thank you for your time. And, and again, we will stick around, but you, you do have our blessing and permission uh, to, to, to start to self-select outwards. So thank you for bearing with us. Hold on a second. Hot, hot mic.